views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Coming up on this edition of Perspectives, the Bronx has some major changes with regards to our political representation. Coming up, we'll talk to the newly elected Bronx Democratic Chair. He's going to be our guest on this edition of Perspectives with yours truly, Darren Hyman. What's on your What's on your mind? What's on your mind? Anything relevant to life, you bring it to the table. Whether you make a move solo or a movement with a stable. No fables, you speak on your decisions. Because in the long run, it's your voice, your views, your vision. Keeping it real with many messages for you to know. This ain't radio, but DJ runs the show. Entertainment, he rocks it. Politics, he locks it. The host with the most would handle any topic. Don't forget to share your perspective which shines a light Cause it might make a difference in someone else's life Make a difference in someone's life Express what's in your heart and your mind Share your perspective And hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Perspectives. I am Darren Hyman. Of course, we thank you for joining us. As always, you can watch Perspectives right here on Bronx that's Channel 67. If you have Verizon files, so better yet, better known as Optimum, that's channel 2133, or of course, anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. We also do encourage you to stay connected to us on all of our social media platforms at Bronxnet TV. If you want to reach me personally, well, you got me on Facebook and Instagram at DCHyme23, as well as uh, Twitter. And then if you want to get me on my professional page, Darren C. Jaime on Facebook, there you'll get some information as well as some inspiration. Well, coming up on today's show, as we said from the outset, major changes in the Bronx political landscape. Joining us now as our next guest is the, he was elected, I should say, as the Bronx Democratic Chair, replacing former Assembly Member Marcus Crespo. He also now, has, uh, Crespo, resigned in June after five years of serving in that role. The Bronx Democratic Party is also uniquely positioned uh, in helping with the political landscape of the Bronx and working to elect Democrats across the borough. Joining me now to talk more about his new role as the Bronx Democratic Chair, sharing his perspective on several topics on our show for the very first time, We've got State Senator Jamal Bailey who joins us, and uh, Senator Bailey, good to have you. Darren, great to be here. You're right; it's it's it's, uh, it's my fault that it took so long, but I'm happy to happy that we're finally um, finally up on the show and been watching you for quite some time. Thank you for the work that you do. No, nah, man, thank you, and I'm glad to have you. And finally, yes, it took a long time coming, but I'm glad you're here. You're now in a new role. I, congratulations is due for you in the new role as Bronx Democratic County Chair. Talk talk to us about what this actually means being Bronx Democratic Chair. So the Bronx Democratic County Committee, well, first let me say thank you for the congratulations, like congratulatory, congratulatory words. Um, the Bronx Democratic County Committee um, elects a chair of the executive committee. And a, the executive committee is comprised of 24 district leaders and an executive committee that's comprised of a vice chair, parliamentarian, and other officers. And, uh, and they saw it fit to elect me as the new chair of the executive committee after um, Former assembly, former assembly member Marcos Crespo, who, who served us quite well for the last five years, decided to step down and pursue other interests. And I'm, I'm very excited and raring to go to be able to, in a time in an era where transformative change is required, I think I can be an agent of that change, but uh, I can only go as far as my team goes. And that team being not just the Democratic County Committee, but all of the Democrats in the borough of the Bronx, and actually all of the people in the borough of the Bronx. So yeah. I'm looking forward to it. And when we talk about the borough of the Bronx, obviously a very diverse borough, a lot to really contend with. Um, when you look at your position right now and you look at the needs of the borough, what comes front and center to your mind? COVID recovery is, is the uh, is the first thing that we have to ensure we dig ourselves out of ever so slightly. And it's not when I say ever so slightly, it's not because I want to do it ever so slightly. I'm just looking at the actual realities. Um, when we're looking at still not having a vaccine, when we have a uh, an oc the current occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue still not taking the COVID-19 crisis as serious as it should be taken. So again, we at the state level, we, we often take our cues and sometimes most importantly, our funding from the federal government. And, um, and, and this administration in Washington hasn't done anything for us there. So, um, and look, we're looking at significant budget cuts at the state level and at the borough level and the city, city level and the borough level, right? And all of that is because the federal government has chosen to ram through a Supreme Court justice before they decide to address a COVID relief package. That's, that's the problem. 
Yeah, uh, State Senator Mitch McConnell saying, see you on November the 9th. I mean, that's absolutely absurd that we can get a Supreme Court justice through and cannot get COVID relief to many of the people who are both Democrat, Republican, independent, uh, who stand in need of this. And so give me this as your position now, your new position. Talk about leverage, right? Because you got work that you have to do across the state. You got work that you have to do across the city. What kind of leverage does this give, Does this position give you, particularly in raising your voice uh, for issues across uh, uh, both the city and state line? It makes me realize that that when I, when I speak, I, I want to speak with one voice for the borough of the Bronx. And I want us to be able to have a collective and galvanized voice. It gives me a platform to be able to speak to other leaders in other parts of our city and state and explain to them that the Bronx is the home of hip hop, the home of salsa, but we're not just the home of hip hop and salsa, but the home of innovation, but the home of leadership, but the home of so many things that have happened at the state level have come out of the, spons the sponsors in the were from the borough of the Bronx when it comes to immigration, the green light bill. Um, the, the, which is the driver's license bill, the Green Act. Those sponsors were from the borough of the Bronx. The criminal justice reform. I, I was the sponsor of many of those bills, and so, so many of my other colleagues in government were. We have the chair of the health committee. We have a we have a nurse who uh, like we have an assembly member who was a who was a nurse in, on the front lines. The Bronx is getting um, the negative attention, but it's not getting the positive that we deserve. And it's my role to ensure that we are accentuating the positives to everybody and anybody that will listen. Let's talk about some of the positive things right now. We are in the middle of election season. People are actually voting. Early voting has begun uh, in New York. Uh, I did my show, uh, you know, yesterday. Somebody tells me, hey, 30,000 in the borough of the Bronx out there hitting the polls already early voting. Then we hear again, those numbers have actually jumped up to 40,000 who've actually started out in early voting. When you look at the numbers that we have for early voting right now, are you happy with what you see? And then compare those to other boroughs. I'm incredibly encouraged. Um, so, like, if you look at the the Bronx, is a is a borough has 1.4 million residents, as compared to some of the other um, boroughs who have either 1.8 Manhattan, roughly 2.3 in Queens, 3.2 roughly in Brooklyn. Um, so, they're going to have higher aggregate totals because they have more people there. But percentage base, percentage wise, we're we're right in line with what's happening happening in those boroughs, and it's been consistent. Um, many people said that it was just going to be Saturday. That everybody was going to line up only on Saturday. Then they lined up on Sunday. Then they lined up yesterday. And then they were out there today. So it, this is showing that there was a commitment from the people in the borough of the Bronx, from the city of New York, to make sure their voices are heard and heard loud. So I'm excited. Yeah. And when we talk about early voting, I mean, this is something that you guys as Democrats in both the Senate uh, and the Assembly really wanted to see happen. Uh, it took a long time to get here. Give me your thoughts as to how do you feel about it now that it's here and now that you see people are actually responding. So on, on the very first day of the of our new majority session, a young man by the name of Zell Noah Myri, a good brother of mine, state senator out of Brooklyn, um, he passed. Uh, he was a sponsor of the bill that passed early vote. So the Senate Dems, this was our major priority. Our first priority coming out of the gate was to make sure that we passed early voting. And that was what, what good leadership gets you. That's when you exercise your votes properly. That's what happens when democracy is in action instead of in action, one word, right? That's what we, that's what we need from people. That's how we need to do it. And, and we set the tone. Now you see, now, now we get to reap the, reap the rewards. Yeah, yeah. And so when we talk about looking at the reward, obviously a lot is at stake with this upcoming election. Uh, the Democrats are hoping both uh, in a, in from on a national front to win both the Congress and the House. Uh, you know, you're the new Bronx Democratic chair. How do you see things playing out on a national level? I, I think that we will hold the House and expand our lead in the House of Representatives. Uh, I, am, I am bullish about the, uh, our chances of, of getting the U.S. Senate back if this record turnout keeps up, um, because there are a lot of there are a lot of um, uh, states that are in play. Mississippi is in play. Arizona is in play. Um, uh, so, you know, so, uh, South Carolina with Jamie Harrison. So many, so many areas are in play that previously weren't, and 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 because of the incompetence of the of the individual who occupies 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, um, we've we have, we we we're having a much stronger foothold and we're able to uh, you know hang our hat on that. Yeah, yeah. In terms of Democrats, the Bronx has always been a highly Democratic borough. Uh, talk to me about not being complacent, because I think so many times when you hear, particularly communities of color, that the voice of the Democrats seems to always flow through, you know, by people of color. Uh, and that's the way the Democratic Party has longly shifted. 
But there is this kind of concern on the part of people of color that the Democrats have taken them for granted. Speak on a local level about making sure that that doesn't occur. Well, we don't take your votes for granted in 36 senatorial district in the borough of the Bronx, the Democrats in the borough of the Bronx. We definitely can't take your vote for granted. The Bronx was the number three in the state, in, not in the state, not in the city, in the country in terms of turnout in the 2016 election. So we are a solidly blue, um, solidly blue uh, borough. But, you know, we can't take folks for granted. We have to figure out what's happening in your individual lives, not just from an electoral perspective, but from an on the ground perspective. And as elected officials, we're never perfect. We could always be doing a little bit better. So it is our job and my job as, a, as the new leader of the party to be is an incumbent upon us to ensure that we're listening to the, the, the different uh, voices or different perspectives, so to speak, that we have out there and make sure we're not just giving you lip service. Make sure that we're actually listening to respond as opposed to listening just to listen. Yeah. Take a quick break with Bronx Democratic Chair, the new Bronx Democratic Chair, Senator Jamal Bailey. Going to take a quick break. After we come back from the break, he's going to talk about his vision for the borough of the Bronx as the newly elected chair. Stay with us. We'll be back with more perspectives right after this. Back here on Perspectives, Darren Jaime here with you. We are so glad to have you sharing with us. As always, we invite you to stay connected to Perspectives. Go to our social media platforms, and if you don't go to our social media platforms, have an opportunity to check us out on the web, see some of the past episodes as we continue to share perspectives as we get closer to Election Day and towards the end of 2020. You're not going to want to miss the opportunity to hear some very important and relevant discussions. We're pleased to have with us State Senator Jamal Bailey, who is the new Bronx Democratic Chair. He's the chair of the Bronx uh, County Democratic Committee, and we're glad to have him sharing with us. Uh, newly elected, uh, he's still new, still green uh, in regards, but he's still got some energy. And so while he got some energy, let's talk about the vision. Uh, Senator Bailey, as you talk about the borough of the Bronx, obviously when a person takes office, uh, they always want to know what's the plan, what's the vision. But give me a little bit about your vision. Uh, I know you're new to this spot, but still, I know you've got a vision there. It's about really understanding and respecting our neighbors and respecting our differences and understanding that the work that we do in silos may be phenomenal on its own and individuals who are doing great work in their individual capacity should do so. But I, I look at um, our borough and I look at this entire world, I, I say, as a team game. I'm a basketball fan, right? And it's great to play one-on-one -on -one basketball. You can get highlights and you can get on ESPN, you can get on SportsCenter, you can do all those great things. But if you want to win championships, you share the ball and you play defense. And it's about understanding that the, the phrase know your role is not one of subservience. Knowing your role means that we all have a part to play in the big in, in this in, in this borough. And I think that we can do that if we're listening to the different views across the borough. For example, the North Bronx and the South Bronx have historically been pitted against each other because because of folks that come from outside of the borough that don't know any better. Right. They don't know that, the, that that it's still the same folks who are having the same issues, right? But we got to, we have to figure out how do we galvanize the North versus in, in the South, as opposed to North versus South, East and West, instead of East versus West. Bring them all together as one Bronx, cohesive on policy. We got to get, we have to be much better in terms of policy because uh, our borough president, Ruben Diaz, always says strong policy means stronger politics. And, that, and I believe that to be, you know, invariably true. I believe that to be definitely the case. Um, we have to have good sound policy and that we have to make sure that we are putting it out to the people that know 
that these things are coming from your Bronx representatives. Right. But talk to me about political engagement, right? Because uh, you want to see residents become more politically engaged. We understand right now with the presidential election, that's going to happen. There are more people who actually go to the polls, vote in a presidential election than any other election. But it's after the presidential election. I think a lot of times uh, those who work in the political circle say, hey, we have to do a better job of getting people more and more engaged. How do you how do you propose getting more voters engaged? How do you propose addressing the issue of young people who are leading the for, in many ways the forefront of this political movement? Um, but how do we get them more engaged? So I'm glad you brought that up, right? Because I have an idea that I that I'm going to be rolling out soon. And we talk about young Democrats and the the, the Democrats who are 18 to 35. What about the youngest Democrats, the younger Democrats? We should be ensuring that people who are the young folks who are 10 years old, eight years old, seven years old, those who are involved in the process, right? I mean, involved in, in our community should know that they have power now. There is no arbitrary age for leadership. You may have to be 18 to register to vote. Actually, 17 pre-registration is some of the great things that a new state legislature can do. Mm -hmm. You can pre-register to vote now. Um, but you shouldn't have to wait until you're 18 to get involved. The first time that you know what a petition is shouldn't be when somebody comes to your door with one. It should be something that we're that we as a party are looking to to, to do. And I and I realize that my role as a party leader has a partisan lens, and of course it leans towards the Democratic Party. Yes, it does. I believe that we are the party that will be able to lead lead this borough forward properly in the future. However, I, I will say this, right? It's it's not just about the, the party affiliation is about making sure people are engaged and involved and meeting people part of the way there, right? We always say meet you halfway, right? I'm not even asking for you to come halfway sometimes. It, can you come a quarter of the way? Can you come 10% of the way, right? Because mm -hmm. we have finite budgets and finite resources in order to get our message out, right? And it's great that people are, are engaged and involved about, about the presidential election. Keep that energy. Keep the energy and transfer it because we have a mayoral election, controller election, public advocate election, and 30 plus, 35 approximately, I think, uh, city council seats that will be up for um, election next year, open seats. And so there's a lot to be excited for in New York City next year. And, um, and, and I hope that people stay active and involved and that turnout isn't just something that we do. Um, it's not like the folks who go to church only on Easter, right? Don't go to church on Easter. You know, come on, come come through on each Sunday if right. you can, right? Preaching to the choir right here, brother. I know what that means. Uh, listen, uh, talk to me a little bit more about this here. We began the show talking a little bit about COVID, right, and COVID-19 and, and, and basically the relief for COVID-19. There is a concern on the part of a lot of people across New York City and New York State about where whether or not there's actually going to be an adequate amount of resources. We know that a lot of money is spent on ventilators. We know that a lot of budget cuts are possibly, well, have already occurred and still continue to loom um, with the fact of all that's going on with COVID. We're not still certain about how this whole second surge is actually playing out. Give me your thoughts about resources and you know fiscal cuts because it starts in Albany. You're right there at the top and you get to see exactly what it is. Any major concern about the upcoming impending budget year in the wake following COVID? There's definitely a concern. Um, one, again, the federal government has to step up. They've been a part. Mitch McConnell, again, has decided to stake um, the, the put the country in peril because of his desire to, to, to steamroll a, a Supreme Court justice um, through in the sake of having a 6-3 conservative majority. Right. So they haven't addressed the Heroes Act, but they, they but they addressed the courts. Right. Fine. But also, since if they're not going to do that at the state level, we should be looking at and exploring ways for revenue raises at the state level, um, looking at ways to see those of us in society, um, not me or not you, but those of those individuals who are in the one percent or the top one percent who are making a significant amount of money. And many of those individuals have, got, have gotten richer, believe it or not, during this pandemic. Uh, those folks should be paying a little bit more um, in terms of being a, in terms of taxes in order to be able to help out their fellow sister and their brother. So that's something that I think that we should be looking at. Um, again, all of these things are contingent upon the federal government um, and in conversations with leadership there and leadership in our state. Coming to take a quick break with Senator Jamal Bailey. We'll be back with him in just a few seconds. Roar on perspectives. He is the new Bronx Democratic County Chair. 
And uh, guess what? He's giving us his perspective right here. We'll have more with him in our final segment when we return right after this. Back here on Perspectives, Darren Jaime here with you. Our guest today, State Senator Jamal Bailey, the newly elected Bronx Democratic County Chair. Glad to have him sharing with us here on Perspectives, bringing us the exclusive, <laughs> and we'll call it, uh, the first time we actually have him here. Hopefully it won't be the last, and we know it won't be the last. But uh, listen, uh, let me get into this here. We talked a little bit about the work that goes on, and we talked about budget cuts. One of the things that we've talked about in, in on our show previously is the New York City and and Black Lives Matter and those who are anti-police or you know anti-police brutality I should say has spoken about actually defunding the police and I know that you've had a lot of things going on with police reform your legislation that deals with with criminal justice reform and police reform give me your thoughts about this defunding the police because uh, there's a certain sector that says it's good there's a certain sector that says not so not so good give me your perspective I believe that we should be refunding the community. That's that's that, that's what I think, right? If you're asking people where should money go, money should go towards root cause issues. Money should go towards education. Money should go towards uh, quality quality of life issues. That's where funding should go. Do I believe in good police? Absolutely. I, I believe that I, I believe that the vast majority of police um, intend and in, in, in carry out, I should say, their jobs in an efficient and respectful manner. The issue that we have, right? Those of us in the legislature, we have issues with um, not only just bad apples, right? But the, the the inability to remove those bad apples from the bunch because they say bad apples spoil the bunch, but I'm gonna take it a step further. I don't think that bad apples spoil the bunch. I think that bad apples make you not wanna buy apples. Because if you go in a supermarket every single time, mm -hmm. every time you wanna pick up an apple, it's rotten. You're not going to want to buy apples anymore, at least from not, not from that supermarket, right? right? I think that's about the public trust. People want to trust the police. When I go into schools or uh, pre-COVID when we were going to schools and you ask kids what they want to be, police is still up, up there in the top five things that, that kids want to do, even in the inner city, right? Even when we're having the, where we're having the most strife between police and community, um, kids still want to, want to do that. So where's the gap? And the gap has to be that police and community not only have to, we have to trust each other. We have to have trust and respect each other. It's not just a one way street. Yeah, but if you talk to people in NYPD brass, they say this is probably the worst time. Morale is low. A lot of people are taking the retirement packages. Uh, they're losing officers uh, right and left. And let's be honest, amidst the, the time is not really a popular time to become a police officer. Do you think that, you know, in, in your role that we can do something with regards to diversity? Because uh, that is a major issue in terms of dealing with a lot of these these acts. I mean, we saw exactly, and that's a totally different situation that happened in Philadelphia, but it's one more situation that continues to just take us all back to the place of reform needs to be, needs to be made, and it's systemic reform. Yes. Uh, in a word, yes, Darren. I, I think that it's it's critical to have uh, officers that understand the communities that they that they police, right? Um, it is it is you cannot have individuals who come to your community and and believe that um, the individuals there are less than, right? So that that has to be something where we're having 
like legitimate conversations about unconscious bias and more training for officers. Because again, I don't think that the vast majority of the officers leave the academy intending to do harm to people. I believe though, that we should have, like, as you mentioned, a diverse, a, a diverse array of individuals who represent and police the communities um, around our city and state. And I, and I think that we can achieve that. Um, again, it's about making sure that there's, that there's an interest in policing and that policing is done respectful and that there's a respect level on both sides, that the police respect the community as well as the community respecting the police. Yeah. Uh, before we get out of here, i got a couple more questions for you. I want to talk to you also about, you know, now that you're in this new role, right, and the Bronx Democratic uh, County Chair, um, do you see it possibly as uh, a model? Because you do have this highly democratic borough. Do you see it as a model for other places across the nation? Well, I, I, I would hope so, right? I think that we are a center of innovation in the borough, and I think that we've done some things um, already. We've expanded the number of vice chairs and created more diversity within those, within those ranks. Um, um, we're actually holding a phone bank uh, on, on uh, coming up with, with district leaders, highlighting the district leaders. We're doing things that, that are a little bit different than uh, other boroughs have done. Um, and you know, and again, I, I rely on 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 um, on the people around me, my staff and my my colleagues in government, um, who who help to shape some of the thought processes that 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 I have. And one of the things that I walk into this right, and, and I walk into this with with the phrase with the phrase or an adage that my dad told me: the best thing is knowing the best thing that you can know is knowing that you don't know it all. And I know I don't know it all, and I'm receptive to what. Uh, the great people of the borough of the Bronx can teach me, and I'm I'm looking forward to learning as well as teaching. All right. Well, before we leave, uh, I just want to get an opportunity to get your final thoughts as we get closer towards uh, Election Day. What do you want to tell Bronxites? Uh, I'm going to be strictly partisan here, and usually uh, nothing against my some of my actually good friends in the Republican Party, but this is not the time to cross party lines. My Democratic friends and Republicans. The demo case at the time is always right to do what's right. Trump doesn't represent you. He doesn't represent anything decent. He doesn't represent your values. He doesn't represent decency and humanity. He represents an individual who has ignored the COVID-19 crisis, who has ignored decency, and has, is looking to ensure that the Supreme Court is filled for his gains in the event that he loses this election. This is not the party of Lincoln. This is not the president of Lincoln. This is not the president of decency. I urge you and encourage you, anybody within the sound of my voice, so that including, but not limited to, limited to November 3rd, because we have early voting, that we bring an end to the error of the Trump administration and we ensure that we go down the ballot, vote row, vote row A all the way, bring Democrats home from coast to coast, sweep the House, bring back the Senate, and let's bring it all home. All right. State Senator Jamal Bailey, new Bronx Democratic County Chair. Listen, we want to have you back, so make sure you stay connected to us. Yes, sir. All righty. Thank you for joining us here on Perspectives. All right, and that about wraps it up for this edition of Perspectives. I am Darren Jaime. I want to thank you for watching. As always, you can have the opportunity to watch Perspectives every week here on Bronx's Channel 67, also Channel 2133 if you're watching on Optimum and anytime, as we said, on the web at bronxnet.org. Most of all, my brothers and sisters, exercise your right to vote. We can't tell you who to vote for. We can't tell you how to exercise your right to vote. And do this too. Share your perspective because you just don't know. It might make a difference in someone else's life. Till next time we meet, take care. God bless. Darren Hyman, signing off.